Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Haruv, for having me. It's such a pleasure. Um, and I think that while this time has been really interesting, it's offered so much opportunity for people to connect from all over the world. And I've been on so many meetings with um, international folks and it is, um, it's neat to, that we live in a day and age that we have that opportunity. So thank you for having me. I hope that today is of help and of use for everybody on the line. And um, as Gal explained at the end, I'd love to answer any and all questions that anybody has. Um, and so we'll get started from there. So my name is Lori Poland, and I am the Executive Director of the National Foundation and Child Abuse and Neglect. Um, I have been with the foundation for two years. We, I, myself and Dr. Richard Krugman founded NCAN um, a couple of years ago after many um, years even of just having discussions of how we could do things a little bit differently and how we could fill in the gap. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, and, um, but I wanna start with kind of some information of what most of us do know. And these are statistics just from the United States um, in 2017. So we all know that child abuse and neglect is an under addressed public health crisis. Um, just in two, 2017, there were 1,720 uh, deaths from physical, sexual, and psychological abuse um, on children. And those are um, only numbers that are reported that have an absolute zero question uh, whether they were correlated to child abuse and neglect. 674,000 substantiated cases were opened in 2017 for children. Um, for abuse and neglect, and that does not include the millions and millions of calls that came in to the child welfare system and or the millions and millions of calls that did not come in to the child welfare system. So unfortunately, as many of us on this call know, the um, numbers that uh, we see and the reality are often, there's a really strong disconnect there. Um, another staggering number to me is that over the total lifetime, the estimated costs associated with one year of confirmed cases of child abuse and neglect is $124 billion. So we know that when children experience hardship and abuse as small as little ones, the lifetime expense is so astronomical. And um, even just from a business model, I think that it would make a lot of sense if we kind of flipped that upside down and um, really invested in families and children at a younger age. So uh, we also know uh, the health impacts of abuse and neglect. Thank goodness for the ACEs study in the late 90s that really showed uh, the correlation between physical health and later in life illnesses to those early years of adverse childhood experiences. So on this screen, you'll see a few of those like physical health impacts, heart disease, liver and lung disease, hypertension, cancer, asthma, obesity, diabetes, and a lot of autoimmune diseases um, are all correlated with early, those early impacts. Um, the risk for chronic disease goes up 28% of for mal maltreated children. Uh, chronic health disease is or amber condition is oftentimes found within three years of the experienced abuse or neglect. As we know that the body immediately has such a visceral response and isn't able to continue on caring for itself when it's introduced to those trauma impacts. We also know there's been so much research, especially in the last 10 years, on the impacts of impaired brain development and how that can really change the long-term um, way that the brain is responding and acting and or remembering or not. Um, all of these different cognitive issues, language problems, and specifically academic problems, which goes back into the um, billions of dollars that we spend later on. Um, and then the one that is most heartbreaking for me is a reduced life expectancy. We know that when um, people experience adverse childhood experiences, the life, their lifespan can reduce up to 20 years. 
and that um, that's a little scary for those of us, myself included, who have a fairly high ACE score. Um, and so hopefully more and more research is done and with all of our work collectively, we can be a larger voice to really create some change. Uh, right when the NCAN started two years ago, we commissioned Research America to help us with a, a, a survey and Zagby completed, uh, Zogby, excuse me, completed this survey and uh, we know that the people, the ones who grew up to live on, they answer the questions and they were able to answer the questions that child abuse and neglect is the fourth rated top public health concern um, facing our nation in the United States. Uh, we were really surprised by those outcomes. That, and I, I do want to clarify that the Zogby analysis was not done solely for people who are survivors, but we know that there are tens of millions of adult survivors who have either shared their story or kept their story secret um, because as a, social, as a society and socially, it's really not been something that people are very comfortable talking about. So um, this number was really surprising for us. And uh, while we'd love to see it decrease, it is a uh, little helpful to know that the general public sees child abuse and neglect as a public health issue. Um, so one of the things that's most important to me and really why I do this work and what led me to become a mental health therapist is listening to the voice of survivors. Some of the survivors that I've heard in the last two years and being with NCAN is um, them saying things like, keep talking until someone listens. Uh, for me, that's both concerning and empowering. The empowering part is that we're gonna keep speaking until we hear one another. And so then let's join our voices and let's all talk. The um, hard part for that is that why do we have to keep raising our voices and keep fighting uh, in order for somebody to hear us and know that our voice matters? So I'm gonna get more into that here in a few minutes as well. Um, another survivor said, I learned to be strong. And that's one thing that we know out of, um, out of life is that some people really, really focus on resiliency and they have the power to become strong and transcenders and truly um, take their hardships and their experiences and pay that forward and give that back to anybody that they can. And I just find that so beautiful. Another quote is breaking the silence. And so for me, one of my biggest passions is breaking the silence. While it has been incredibly challenging and there's been a lot of backlash and hardship that's come from that, breaking the silence um, is, is, is a big part of it for me. And then um, another thing that I find is such a systemic issue really all over the globe is that you have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you were hurt. Survivors have to prove that they were hurt. And then nobody wants to hear them unless you're willing to be a poster child. Um, I've experienced that a lot myself and we have been really delicate in NCAN making sure that survivors know they don't have to share their story. We're not um, in a place of wanting to have anybody be a poster anything, but really that united our voices can be a lot more impactful. So I'm gonna share with you, I have to close out my screen because um, for some reason, the videos that I have embedded here today are not being as friendly as we'd like them to be. So I'm just going to do it a little bit the old school style. So um, I'm gonna share this video about being louder than silence. I'm realizing, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to start all over. Please bear with me, I'm not a techie, I'm a therapist. <laughs> and so, I'm gonna reshare re -share screen, thank you. I'm sorry, I should have known that, I did know that, we even covered it. <laughs> One moment at a time, right? Okay, here we go. I'll start over.
Okay. Oh, cancel. All right, coming back to you. Give me one second. And current slide. Okay. So that's a video that we made um, with one of our board members and his marketing company um, to really help spread the message that we have to unite our voices and be louder than the silence that so many victims of child abuse and neglect have um, lived with for so many years. And I'd love to tell you now about my story and my experience. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. I don't know anybody in this picture, but I just find it so funny because um, it's Lori, my we're, we're not seeing the slides. Oh, darn it. Thank you. See, I appreciate that somebody's got my back here. Thanks. Let me try this again. Oh. Um, share screen. Here we go. Now you're gonna see the fun screen, okay. There we go. Or the fun slide, there we go, okay. So it's a roller coaster. Um, my life has been a true roller coaster. I love this picture because like, there's several people in it who are terrified and then several other people in it who are smiling. And I feel like some days um, my life is like that. I'm one minute I'm smiling and the next minute I'm terrified. And um, a lot of that comes from my experience of early trauma and so I'm just gonna share with you um, the, the Cliff's Notes version of my life and uh, what brought me to do this work. And so when I was three years old, I was playing in my front yard. It was 1983 and it was a really hot summer day here in Colorado. And um, I was playing in the gutter. Uh, we lived in a really a poverty stricken community. And I was playing in the gutter with a toy boat. And my brother and I had both um, lured my dad into giving us another popsicle right after our mom went back to work after her lunch break with us. And my dad had taken the day off of work to join us and uh, to be home with my brother and I. And um, while my dad went inside to get us the popsicle, a car drove up, it was an orange Datsun, and the passenger door was already opened when he pulled up to right in front of me. And he asked if I liked candy, and like any sugar-loving three-year-old, I said yes, and I eagerly got in the car with him. And we negotiated that I would leave my pants there on the curb of the sidewalk, and my five-year-old brother, was standing up by our front porch or on our front porch by our front door waiting for those popsicles and his big blue eyes were just watching this all happen and um the before i mean within seconds within seconds my abductor took me and we drove off and by the time my dad came back outside and looked at the curb and looked at my brother and looked at the curb, and then my brother let out this horrific sound, my dad said, and um, off he went. Uh, my, my dad came after us, uh, but he, by the time he got to the end of our street, he didn't even know what direction we had gone. And so um, my abductor took me up to the mountains and he found an old abandoned outhouse toilet um, where people use the restroom and when they're up hiking or camping and things like that. Um, and after however long we were together of him severely abusing me, he placed me in the toilet of one of those outhouses, um, dropping first the candy and then me um, telling me to go get it. And I was 15 feet below ground for three and a half days. Um, I remember a few moments of being with him. One was being in the car with him. Another moment was um, being in the pit of the toilet and crying for my mom and being worried that she was going to be upset with me because I needed to go to the bathroom. I had just gotten potty trained and I didn't want to let her down. And so, um, and then my last moment of memory was the moment that the, my rescuer came down and told me to grab onto his neck. Um, he said, hold on. And they lured me up. And then I was reunited with my family um, just a little while later. 
And about a week and a half later, I was able to, at the age of three, go to the police department and um, where they brought in 10 men and they lined them all up behind a two-way mirror and videotaped me watching each one of them step forward. And when they stepped forward, they asked if I liked candy. And um, it was my job to tell the police which one of the men in the line had hurt me. And when they got to man number four, I said, mommy, that's the bad man that put me in the hole. So they were able to take this video over to an agency that Dr. Krugman had, was the director of. And um, they asked Dr. Krugman if this video was reliable. And Dr. Krugman and the psychiatrist there named David Jones said to the, the police department, yes, it's reliable, but it's not admissible. And so then about uh, just a couple of days later, I started doing a forensic interview on video with David Jones, who had the most darling British accent. Um, and David was David and I were in a playroom and we talked about my abduction and my kidnapping and the defense attorney and the prosecutor, Dr. Krugman, who manned the video camera, um, and maybe one or two other people were behind the two-way mirror in that agency. And they were able to, via a, an earbud, ask David Jones to ask me questions, clarifying questions. Like, um, I was able to pick through a bunch of pictures and continuously say, well, this is Mike, this is Tom, this is... Jerry, and this is the bad guy. And I just was able to do that a lot. And I was a sassy little girl. I'm still quite sassy um, and confident, um, but I was back then too. And that, uh, the, I went to five of those video um, testimonials or and or forensic interviews um, and was able, th those videos were able to uh, essentially force my abductor into pleading um, guilty, and he was charged at the time, and granted this was 1983, and laws were very, very different to protect children back then, but he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. I was not his first conviction, not even close to his first conviction, um, and then he was released after six years for good behavior. And so many people would think and have thought and have shared with me, um, A, that I was not a victim of child abuse because my abuse occurred um, outside of my family. And um, I just, you know, for me, I know that I was a victim of child abuse uh, because no child should ever be hurt in any such way. Um, and so, so, I've struggled with that over the years, but then also the other piece that um, that I've heard a lot is that there's an expectation in a belief system that when abuse occurs, and maybe after a little bit of counseling, like I, those forensic interviews were done by a psychiatrist, and he was a phenomenal clinician, um, allowing me to play out my experience um, really, he, he was child directed. The, it was a play therapy session that was client centered and um, he was exceptional in every way. Um, and so one would think that even after those interactions that I would be okay. And there were even times in my life when I was okay. There was a lot of consistency and predictability and stability from my parents um, at times throughout my life, but that doesn't mean that in every single life transition that I've gone through, my experience and my early trauma has not come back up. It continues to be something 37 years later that I am dealing with, um, not you know as horrifically and hardship-wise as I did when I was a small child, but it, it, in a different way. And it completely changed the way that I trusted and, see, and saw the world. Um, the relationships that I have, the interactions that I've had, um, my capacity to feel safe and secure, um, all of those things altered 
when at the very, very young age of three, my sense of normalcy and security and safety was completely uprooted. And it's, it's almost like um, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Right. So once it's out, it's out. And I couldn't undo that stuff that had already been done. Instead, I've had to learn over the last 37 years um, how to manage and cope and be transparent with wherever I'm at in my life on any given day. Um, and that's been a really interesting journey. It's allowed me to be really, really empathic and understanding for other survivors. And there are millions and millions and millions of people all over this globe who have experienced worse traumas than I, and maybe even less worse traumas than I. Um, but I don't see any of our stories as different. I see them all as our story. And so for me, I'm aging when my abductor was um, released, I was 11 years old, and I was in the third, I was 10 years old, excuse me, and I was in the third grade, uh, fourth grade when he got out, third grade when he was up for parole, and um, he was given one extra year. But at that time, we had moved, and I had built a new set of community um, friends, and None of my friends and I talked about my kidnapping. We all just were kids playing. But when the news media released that my abductor was up for parole, um, all of my friends and their families saw me on TV. And that was a whole other traumatic experience of being ostracized and judged and picked on and different from my community and my environment. Um, and so the residual effects of trauma and the residual effects of child abuse are everlasting. They uh, came up another, uh, in another way when I had my own children. I have three children, two girls. My oldest are, are girls and my youngest is a boy. And so when my daughter, my oldest daughter was born, I experienced really significant postpartum depression because after I got pregnant, I realized, oh my heavens, I am bringing a child into a world that could cause so much harm. How am I gonna keep her safe? How am I gonna protect her? How am I gonna ensure that nothing bad happens to her? Um, and that went on until she was about um, 13 months when I really started coming out of that, that dark cloud of postpartum um, through therapeutic support and work. And um, then I you know, began to trust myself as a mother and know that you know, I, I'm not going to be able to protect my children from everything, that there are going to be things that my children experience and have to go through that I'm going to, instead of protect them, have to help them be okay with um, and heal from and overcome and, and transcend themselves. And so, um, you know, when my daughter turned three, I prepared for that and I did this whole, um, almost like a ritual with her. And I did the same thing with my second daughter. What I didn't do was do that with my son uh, because I didn't think it would be the same. My son was a boy and I was not. And so I didn't think that there was a correlation. Um, however, I did know, I knew for a very, very long time that my abductor at the age of three, his, at, let me just rewind, I apologize. Um, his neighbors had come forward and shared some information um, with some of the people involved in my case. And they had shared that when he was a little boy, he was about three years old, and he would be at their house crying and begging not to go home, begging to stay at their home. And, um, and they had shared that in hindsight, they didn't know what to do. And they had felt so bad that they didn't do enough, that they didn't do um, what they ought to have. And, um, and so for me, when I knew that my abductor at the age of three did not get the help and services that he needed, uh, which very well could have prevented him from hurting me, uh, and I wouldn't have needed the help and services that I've needed, right? So it just, it's kind of this domino effect. And so when my son was born, or, and when my son turned three, 
I didn't realize that I would have the exact same response. But my, with him, it was more of an empathy towards my abductor and trying to understand um, what the world looked like from his perspective as a three-year-old little boy. And so it's interesting as my life has carried on, the things that have triggered that I'd never expected and thought would trigger, but it sure led me into wanting to do something um, and wanting to break the cycle of abuse and truly transcend and pay forward the support and um, love and tenderness that I got after my experience with as many people as I possibly could. And so um, I do wanna emphasize that my story is only one story. Um, and there are a lot of versions of my story, but it's really, really important that every voice is imperative to create the necessary change. Um, we've, we oftentimes forget that we strip the voices of our survivors. We assume that we know how they feel and what they feel. And then we also, as I shared earlier, that we think that it's over when the abuse ends. But it's not over. And if we can bear those things in mind, those lessons, I think we can be a lot more impactful with the work that we're all doing. Because for me, if somebody had um, given that voice to me by simply saying to me, this is something you're going to have a hard time with throughout all of your life, I probably wouldn't have felt so shamed and shameful as an adult, still struggling with something that happened so many years ago. Um, I would have known, okay, now I'm a mother and I have to deal with this. Now I'm in a relationship and I have to deal with this. Now I'm not in a relationship and I have to deal with this. Those kind of things, I would have learned how to transition um, over time. And I just want to share that with people on the call because uh, I believe that if we're all just knowledgeable about some of those pieces, we can be significantly more impactful. Um, what we do know after abuse occurs is that nearly all people who have abused do not grow up to become abusers. We don't know what that statistic is because we don't know the true number of adult survivors. Um, and we don't, we haven't um, changed the conversation about it and allowed people to even openly converse about their own experiences, which I am truly inviting everybody to do. But what we also do know is that 99% of offenders were once abused. And this is a population of people that I've spent a lot of years talking to. I don't do it all the time, but when I do do it, it seems to be the most profound experience for me is talking with sex offenders specifically. Um, because I oftentimes what I found is that the sex offender groups that I've spoken to, when I ask them, first I just share with them, I'm not here to judge any of you. And I know that um, all of you, if had given the opportunity to get support and services from your own experiences, many people in this room would have made different life choices. Um, but when I do ask, how many of the people in the room have been abused, there's not one single hand that's down, ever. And to me, that is mind blowing. And what it's taught me is A, empathy, and B, compassion. And C, it does not justify and or excuse their behaviors. And so for me, I'm able to say that to them and openly talk with them about that and, and really ideally see shift and change for them, but understanding that shame and guilt is um, probably one of the hardest experiences for any human to have. And survivors of child abuse themselves have so much shame and guilt. Um, the abusers of child abuse um, and neglect also have a lot of shame and guilt. And then bystanders, so those neighbors that I was talking about earlier, also have an immense amount of guilt and shame. And so if we can really begin to eliminate the shame and guilt by coming at this from a non-judgmental place, I think we can be a lot more impactful 
And that has been my focus. And so I just bear the question is what if, what if we helped the, throughout the whole lifespan? What if we knew that people were going to need safe, nurturing, and healthy environments their whole lifespan? And if at any point there was a disruption in that nurturing, safe, and healthy environment, that it's our job to continue on supporting them throughout their entire lifespan so that they do not feel the shame and guilt and or become the offenders that we don't need um, that would truly break the cycle. And then the next what if is what if we all took part in being the change? And for me, being the change is uniting our voices. We have seen so many health issues and so what we're seeing originally as social issues like suicide and smoking and cancer um, all of those are just examples AIDS is another one teen pregnancy is another one we've seen those things 40 50 years ago where nobody spoke of them nobody wanted to talk about um, being suicidal or having depression or having breast cancer. You kept that in your own family. That happened behind closed doors. We took care of it within our own system. Um, and then you, you, know, you just plugged away. But that secrecy and that silence truly breeds shame. And so what if we all took part in changing the conversation to openly talking about child abuse and neglect where there is no judgment, there is no um, shame or guilting of one another, but instead just openly talking about it. We don't have to make everybody the bad guy or make everybody the victim or make anybody you know, the superhero, but we're all just openly talking about it. And if we did that, we might see, like many of those other things, improvement. We might see significantly more research and understanding we might hear from the adults who are contemplating wanting to hurt their children before they actually hurt their children. One of my favorite quotes is from Henry Kemp, and he said, abusive parents love their children very much, just not very well. And it's our job to teach them how to do it better. So for me, I, I believe that all of us partaking in that, that is the answer to truly help each other do it better. Um, and then the next what if is what if we embraced our life impacts and found healing from them? So instead of um, staying in a victim stance, which I am absolutely guilty of doing at times, many, many times throughout my life, um, if I instead took my experience and really found healing from it and have gratitude from my experience, which most days I do, there are still many days where I do not have gratitude for being an abuse survivor. But if I instead took that life impact and I found healing from it, that healing allows me to be the change that I want to see in the world. And I spread that as much as I can to really anybody who listens. I get captive audiences of 120 plus people like you. I can't see any of you, but you can all see me. And so um, I like kind of force my message onto anybody that would be interested in listening, hoping that just one, that's all I need is just one person feels impacted and understands and can um, relate to my words so that you too can be louder than silence and be part of the change because ultimately we are all survivors. And that's the last what if, is what if we were all survivors? And um, I don't think that many of us realize that child abuse and neglect truly impacts everything, everything. It's like one drop of poison can ruin the whole barrel of water it truly impacts everything. Everything I've ever touched, <laughs> I have had an impact on for better or for worse. I know that I've, my abduction has caused a lot of harm. I know that it's caused a lot of good. I know that it's caused a lot of heartache. It's caused a lot of resentment. 
it's caused so many things, but every single person I've ever come in contact with that has some connection to it, it has changed the way that they see the world. And I know that child abuse and neglect in every capacity affects all of us. Every speech that I've ever given, aside from ones like this, this is you know, a rarity, I typically ask the audience, how many of you know somebody who was impacted by child abuse and neglect? And again, every single hand, aside from a couple stubborn few, but I just believe it's because they're stubborn, um, every single hand goes up. Everybody has um, the capacity to be contacted and connected to child abuse and neglect. And so ultimately that tells me that we are all survivors of child abuse and neglect. So I don't think this is gonna work, so I'm gonna stop share because I wanna share one more video that we did, and then I'm gonna share screen. The world is full of proud survivors. If you survived cancer, you're open about it. You donate, you advocate, you fundraise. For those who have overcome addiction, we help them celebrate the anniversary of their sobriety. But there's one instance where the survivors keep it quiet, where its effect touches anyone and everything around it, causing more pain, where pride is replaced by shame, it's child abuse and neglect. For those who have suffered abuse, it's uncomfortable, it's embarrassing, and it's too rarely talked about. But these people are not victims. They are survivors. Once you embrace it, you realize you are not alone. We are all survivors. The parent who blames herself for not stopping it the next door neighbor who beats himself up for not noticing, the community that is impacted, they are also survivors. We are all survivors because we made it this far. So as survivors, let's not bury it. Let's embrace it. Let's go from hiding our shame to defying it. From standing in the shadow to stepping into the daylight. Because when it comes to child abuse and neglect, none of us are alone. None of us are at fault. We are all touched by it. We are all affected. We are all survivors. Our voices will end the silence. Your dollars will end the abuse. Oh my heavens, I need a tech person. <laughs> okay, coming back, stop share. And then share screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Somebody say yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, so that um, ultimately wraps up my message. I'm uh, just a few minutes early, which means we have a few more minutes that we can do questions and answers. But I truly just want to thank you for listening to me and um, helping um, to understand a little bit the voice of survivors and how impactful they can be. And when we're all doing our work, sometimes it's really, really important just to stop what we're doing and turn around and ask the people we've helped, how was that for you? Did that help you? What can I do different? What can I do better? How can I be of better service for the next folks? So I thank you all for having me. I'm Lori Poland, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Foundation for Child Abuse, to End Child Abuse and Neglect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Um, I need to take a breath.
Uh, it was, as I said at the beginning, I didn't know uh, how your session is going to look like, and, but I promised them that it's going to be very different from what we had until now. Yeah. So inspiring. Thank you. Um, I wish I could have learned from you how uh, to have so much compassion, uh, you know, to um, understand offenders more. Uh, we really need this. Yeah, I agree with you. It was like, and thanks, thanks for Richard Krugman and and Ken, all the staff of and Ken. Um, thank you very much for today. And I will just stop talking. <laughs> and I will let, I know that there are already questions in the chat. So, Christina. All right. Thank you, Lori. That was yeah. a nice presentation. And all the videos worked, which is awesome. Hey, I know. A little unique, Leanne. Thank you for your patience with my fabulous tech skills. <laughs> of course. All right. So, our first question is Why do you think our abuse? prevention programs all speak to potential victims or parents of victims instead of potential abusers? You know, um, the, it's interesting. That's a great question. And I think for me, it's, uh, it really speaks to what, like, what is prevention? And I have had this conversation with so many people that, um, you know, I see the I see the human life as kind of this um, infinity symbol, right? And and so, where on the prevention model is it most appropriate to intervene, right? I, in that spectrum, and so we've I've found in my work, especially um, as a clinician and in the work of the whole system that we begin to label people at risk and when we label people at risk we are automatically making a bias and an assumption over them when there are so many people i would imagine that even many people on this call because once you know one survivor knows another survivor we and and there's so many survivors that are doing this work right that it's how we get into this work for many of us. And I'm not trying to label or assume anybody, uh, anybody's position, but where does prevention actually begin? And, and when we begin to at-risk label people, we're eliminating a whole population of people that need those, this, the same support and maybe even more. My abductor came from a very, very well-to-do family. They lived in a, a upper class community and, um, and I did not, right? So I was very at risk if you, if you look at it from that perspective, but my abuse did not happen from somebody within my family system. And so for me and at ENDCAN, our focus is twofold. One is to bring voices to survivors and unite all of those voices like we've done with breast cancer and um, you know, suicide and heart disease and all of those walks that we all get up to early on Saturday mornings to do, um, that we need to do the same kind of thing for survivors of child abuse and neglect. But then the second part is a really important one with bridging um, cross-sector organizations and entities together, that working with edu our education system, with our um, young adults, with our new parents, with people that aren't even parents yet, um, working with grandparents. I mean, the whole lifespan is a prevention platform. And so, it's not so much for me about when to intervene, it's about that we are always intervening and that we're supporting everybody equally, that it's universal access to have home visiting. It shouldn't be only for people that are considered at risk or only for parents on their first child. My third child was harder than my first two, you know? And, and so those are just the way, that's just the way that I look at it is when do we intervene? and that prevention is the whole lifespan. And if we all work together with our 
legal systems and our healthcare systems and our education systems and our child welfare, we're going to be doing things a lot differently because there's really no um, exclusion or inclusion that occurs. Thank you for that. Um, so the next question is, any advice for working with a kid who was abused at a young age and now 10 years later has blocked a lot of the memories, how to help them heal? Absolutely. So um, the, the, in my work, so I still have a very small private practice uh, where I serve um, individuals all the way from small children all the way up into adulthood because it's such a passion of mine. I'm working with the, the human, right? The soul to soul connection. And um, one thing that I am very strong, strongly opinionated about is just talking very openly and modeling how their experience is normal. And so many people, even today, from I got a, a very long email from two former clients who came together, they're good friends, and, and I sent me this email asking about why did we forget? Why have we forgotten so many things? Why do we have these experiences in our lives where we block out um, chunks of time? And I too have had that where it's almost like dissociation, right? But it's years of my life that I don't remember. And, um, you know, one of the things that I do in my practice and when working with survivors is letting them know that A, it's really normal for your body to stop bringing in information because if your water is already boiling, you can't put anything else in there, right? So your body is doing what it needs to do. And the more that we slow down and attend to our body and be present with our body, the more we're able to let memory come in and or um, new experiences come in without us needing to block them out and not remember them. So when you're working with somebody that has no memory, for me, it's letting them know that that's okay, that you might not be able to consciously remember it. And there will be times in your life where you're going to have experiences, whether it's an intimate relationships or child rearing or the loss of somebody, seeing somebody that reminds you of your offender um, or even unexpected triggers, the likelihood of you getting re-triggered can be high. And so just naming all of that for them so that they know what to expect, then they don't quite feel so, um, unique and different and scared and vulnerable and alone when those things do occur. Um, so that would, that would be my best advice for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have um, a really good question actually. Do you find it hard to stay professional and or not have flashbacks during a session when you come into contact with a child that has been through similar abuse that you have? Great. Great question. Um, you know, it's interesting, and I, I think my education system, I went to Regis University, and they really taught me about um, that professional capacity and being able to um, disclose if I'm having any, um, you know, vicarious trauma and or transparent experiences with my um, clients and and so I'm I can't say that there have been very many times in session where I find myself having a where I'm having a trigger and feeling I'm um, really reactive personally but I can say that there have been about four different cases throughout my career where the case itself was highly, highly triggering for me. And for me, it was about having really good supervision and getting my own treatment and services and doing a lot of self-care, which ultimately is what we're modeling for our clients to do, right? We want them to be taking care of themselves. We want them to have somebody in their life that can supervise and guide them through their struggles um, and their ups, right? It doesn't have to just be when things are broken that we need support. Um, and then 
you know, just having the capacity to share and say, that was really hard for me to hear. I can only imagine what it's like for you to be living it. And, you know, some of that, some of that transparency just makes us all feel like, whoo, we are in this together. It doesn't matter how many initials are behind my name. I am a human being and you're a human being. And for every age from five-year-olds all the way up to 55, 75-year-olds, just that transparency can really make us feel like we're being held with a big weighted blanket, you know? So that would be my best advice in the therapeutic setting if something like that happens. And it has kind of happened as I shared. Thank you, Lori. Um, if anybody else has any more questions, we have a few more minutes. Um, Lori, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at the chat when you have a chance, because there's a lot of thank yous and a lot of really awesome collaborations in there between people on the call. Great. And if it's okay, if we can keep it up for like 10, 15 minutes afterwards so that I can um, do that, I would love that. And then I don't know if Stephanie's on the call here. I think she is. But I am. I'm here. If you can help me by just um, capturing anybody that wants more information or wants links yeah. to, or maybe you can post the link to our website which is yeah. www.endcan.org. Um, and that's where uh, those videos are. They're also on YouTube. Thanks, Steph. See, she just shows up. She's my tech support. <laughs> I should have had her in my house. <laughs> but we have this six month rule. <laughs> I, I can also um, forward them all the information. I have the list of the people that, uh, that oh, participated in this meeting. So I can forward them all the information that um, you would like me to. And um, I am really inviting uh, anyone that want to say a few words. Uh, you can open the mic, feel free. Um, hi, Dr. Krugman. It's good to see you. It's good to be seen. I had not heard Lori give this talk ever. I've only known her 37 years. Wow. It was good. Thanks. Thanks for the shrug. <laughs> so this and, uh, is Dick Friedman. He's my sorry. business partner at Endcan. And he was the director of the agency I was talking about earlier. So we've only known each other for the better part of 37 years. And if you have any question to Dr. Krugman, um, so feel free also. I'm just an observer. <laughs> I, I, I would say to you, Gal and Haruv, this has been a fabulous series the last yeah. several weeks. I've gotten to sort of listen in to about three or four of them. They've been terrific. Thank you. Thank you. The preceding was a paid political announcement. <laughs> I'm Dick Krugman. I approve the message. All right. Okay, so if this is all, thank you. Thank you very much again. And now I will leave um, Christina the stage to talk about seeds. And of course, Lori, uh, I will forward you the recording and also the copy of the chat so you will have everything. Oh, great. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so for CEUs, just like the previous lectures, if you registered online and you said you need